Could retro computers really benefit from 3D printing? It turns out, yes, and in a lot of different ways. The hobby of retro computers is usually associated with electronics, which makes a lot of sense. All computers tend to break over time, and you need some electronics knowledge to repair them and restore them. Also, if you want to enhance those computers in any way, you need some electronics knowledge for that. It turns out that 3D printing shares a lot of similarities. It's really helpful to repair or replace physical parts like cases and keys, as well as creating new parts for new accessories. Is it as essential as electronics? Probably not but it's still very useful and really fun. So do I recommend getting into 3D printing for this hobby? Spoiler alert, yes I do. But with some caveats, let's have a look at what 3D printing can do for us and some of my recommendations along the way. I'd like to thank this video sponsor, Brilliant.org. One of the things I try to do in this channel is not just to fix something or get something to work, but I like to go deep and figure out why things work or not the way they do. And that is one of the reasons I'm excited to tell you about Brilliant today. Brilliant offers a variety of online lessons on math, science, and engineering, but what really makes them stand out is that these lessons are focused on making the learning interactive, which is much more effective than just reading something or hearing about it. For example, I decided to check out their electricity and magnetism course. Even though I have an engineering degree, I was still making interesting connections and getting new insights from almost the beginning. It was a great refresher of some of the lower level things that we take for granted when dealing with electronics and computers. They have quite an impressive number of courses, and some of the ones that caught my eye for the future are the astrophysics one and the quantum computing one. Their courses are aimed at people of all sorts of different levels, and they even ask you a few questions when you sign up to steer you in one direction or another. If you're interested, you can try out everything that Brilliant has to offer for free by visiting brilliant.org Noel's RetroLab. Also, the first 200 people to sign up through that link will get 20% off Brilliant Premium's annual subscription. I should make it clear now that this is not a 3D printing tutorial. There are lots of great videos out there already, so go check those out if you're interested. This is just me sharing my experiences about why I think 3D printing is such a great complement to retro computing. And by the way, sometimes people ask me why don't I release more videos? And the answer is because of the time each video takes to prepare. This one, for instance, I've been preparing for over six months. This is not just a quick unboxing video, oh, here are some printers and a couple things you can do with them. I've been pretty much printing non-stop for six months, adjusting, tweaking, and learning. Enough that I've already had to change the nozzle on the filament printer. I know that's nothing compared to the pros that have been doing this for 10 or more years, but it's enough that I feel that I can finally present to you my opinion of 3D printing for retro computers as somebody new to 3D printing. Let's start with the easiest and most common case, printing some kind of small cartridge shell. This could be a replacement for a damaged cartridge or, in this case, an enclosure for a new accessory. This is the cartridge I designed for the SVI-328 a while back, and back then I had a case printed for me. But now I'm finally going to be able to make my own. First of all, we're going to need a model to print. Sometimes you'll have to make your own, and we'll talk about that later, but the great majority of the time, you'll probably be able to find the model you need for free online. The more popular the computer or the accessory you're looking for, the better chances of it being available. In this case, I didn't see any SVI-328 cartridge shell models, but it turns out this cartridge is exactly the same shape as the Atari 2600. And when you search for that one, you instantly get tons of hits. The one I'm going to print is a slightly modified version of that one that fits a bit more snugly around the PCB but the idea is the same. Next, we're going to need a 3D printer, like this Ender 3 S1 Pro that Creality sent me free of charge, but no strings attached, by the way. This is a filament extrusion printer, which means we're gonna need a filament. Actually, make that more filament. Actually, make that lots and lots of filament. I've learned you can never have enough filament, although you really don't wanna have too many open at once because they can get some humidity in them, and then you may have to dry them and you have some issues, but. We'll get to some of that later. Next, we need to tell the printer how exactly we want that model to be printed. For that, we import the STL model into the slicer program. The one I'm using here is the Creality one, since I figured it would have very good support for their own printer, but you can use many other ones. From here, we set some parameters, and it generates a G-code file, which are the precise instructions to the printer on how to create that model. And we need to do the same process with the other half of the case, since it was modeled as two halves that can be screwed together. Then we load the filament, thread it through the filament detector, add it to the hot end, 
insert the SD card with the model, and tell it to print. And off it goes. Just very roughly, the way this type of 3D printer works is by precisely controlling the position of the head in 3D space, as well as controlling how much filament is rolled through the hot head, melted, and deposited. That way, it makes pass after pass, creating thin layers of material until the full model has been printed. This is not a fast process by any means. This cartridge is rather small, but it's still gonna take a good two or three hours just to print half of the cartridge. That might seem like a long time for someone used to printing documents on a laser printer, but eventually you develop a rhythm for it. You can't speed things up much more, so when you have a lot of things to print, the important thing is to start a new print as soon as you finish the other one. So I'll time my long prints with eight or more hours at, to happen at night, and the smaller ones during the day when I can instantly swap them with something else. I literally had this printer working non-stop around the clock for two or three months at one point. Okay, the print is finally done, and uh, you often have to let it cool down a little bit before you can remove it from the bed, but this came out easy enough, and this looks great. Um, looks perfect, and actually, the first time I printed this many, many months ago, when I first got the printer, it came out looking the same. So you can get this kind of prints right off the box, pretty much, which is pretty impressive. So while the other half is printing, I wanted to talk about how 3D printing isn't exactly how I was expecting it. I had read how difficult it was to get prints, and that you had to tweak things constantly, and how people had to start by printing parts to bootstrap their own 3D printer. I'm guessing technology has come a long way, because that was not my experience at all. For the most part, it was a matter of assembling the 3D printer, which was a lot faster than assembling a simple IKEA furniture, powering it on, and printing one of their samples from the SD card. I didn't even have to manually level the bed because it has an auto-leveler feature. And that was it, as ideal as you can get. Now, it's also true that I've had to tweak things since then. So I guess it is true that it's not just like a tool that you're gonna have on the side and then you're gonna use every so often without any tweaking like you would do with your paper printer. I would say that 3D printer is still a bit of a hobby. You will have to constantly make small tweaks and you'll probably want to experiment with different brands and materials and new techniques. The closest analogy that I can think of is making espresso at home. You can probably make a decent shot pretty quickly, but you'll probably constantly be fine tuning it to get that perfect shot. Same thing here with 3D printing. In any case, here's the other half of the cartridge shell, and it also looks great. They seem to fit together, no problem. And let's do a quick test to make sure the PCB fits in correctly. And yeah, it seems to be perfect. So I think it's realistic that you can get a 3D printer like this one and start making simple prints like this one with minimal tweaking. Let's print something else. I didn't pick this as the next print because it's much more challenging, but because of how different it is. Remember this blue Commodore 64 that I restored quite a while back and I did the custom blue painting? I really enjoyed that color, I really like it, so I have a display out here in the shelf, but it's kind of precarious just sitting here. It's, you know, if, if I bump these boxes over here, it can easily fall. So I thought maybe we can fix that with 3D printing. Other people have thought of that already, so we don't even have to design the model. We'll pick this one from Thingiverse, and our only decision is to pick a good color for it. I'm thinking I'm gonna go with something gray so it's more neutral. The orientation in which you print a model is important. You want to have as much of a flat base as possible, and you want to minimize overhangs, because if you have a lot of them, then you'll probably need to build some kind of support to prevent the filament from drooping. Whenever you download a model, it usually says if you need support or not. This one is intended to print with the bottom on the bed, but that means there isn't a lot of surface area touching the bed itself. Because I've had issues with models coming loose in the middle of a print, which means I need to throw it away completely and restart, I'm going to select a brim in the slicer. A brim is just some extra material around the first layer of the base that will hopefully keep the model in place. So this just came out of the printer and yeah, it looks great. It's solid. Let's see if it fits. Yeah, that seems to be a perfect fit. So let's do the other one. And there you go, with both stands printed. This is great. This is very secure and it looks better than before because I'm able to move it forward instead of being all the way at the back. And yeah, this is not falling down anytime soon. Yeah, I love it.
Next, I want something slightly more complicated. I have this Commodore 1084S monitor that you may have seen in other videos, and it has the front door missing. That is a very, very common problem because the hinges right here are very weak and eventually they just break with time. So wouldn't it be nice to 3D print one? And as you can imagine, especially being such a common problem, other people have already designed models for it. So let's pick one of those and try it. One tricky thing about this is matching the right color. PLA comes in lots of different colors, but not enough to be able to do a perfect match to the monitor like we would with wall paint. So I found this one online. This is an almond tan. And honestly, it looked closer when I looked at it in the picture online than it does here in person. But it's probably better than just plain white, which is what I had before, or gray. So even if it's not a perfect match, it hopefully will be good. This model is extra challenging for many reasons. The first one is that it's just so large. The slot for the door at the front of the monitor is about 28 centimeters wide, but the printer bed is only 23 and a half centimeters. We could try splitting the model into two pieces, but we're going to do a cooler trick than that. When I add it to the slicer, it even marks it as an invalid model because it just doesn't fit. But if we rotate it just the right way and adjust it a little bit, there. Now it barely fits in the diagonal of the bed. But that's just one of the difficulties. The model is very long and it has very little surface touching the bed, so it's quite likely to come unstuck or warp at some point during the print. I can't even use the brim trick because the brim would probably make it too big. To make matters worse, look at the profile. The shape comes out at an angle, and that's always tricky to print. And finally, because it needs to fit very precisely in the hinges, I'm going to set the quality to high. That way, we'll get a more accurate shape with a smoother finish. Okay, let's do this. I came back half an hour later, and I found this. As I feared, it looks like one of the corners was already coming undone and lifting from the bed. I'm actually not that surprised, given such a long, thin shape, so we'll definitely need to start over. This time, I'm going to use all the tricks I know to try to get it to stick to the printer bed. I'm going to cover the printer bed with painter's tape. Yes, painter's tape. Apparently, PLA sticks to that better than it does to the materials they use for printer beds themselves. I also re-sliced the model with the largest brim I could make that would still fit the bed. I think that ended up being about five rows. So, hopefully this is good enough. Now I'm going to bed, so we'll find out tomorrow morning. And there it is. It's all done. And it was a total of nine hours and 27 minutes. And initially, it looks pretty good. Let's have a look at it. So it came out okay. There's, um, there's a little bit of string in there. That's nothing. That's just some little vussies. It's a little irregular. So you can see some marks in there and some marks in there. Those are the kind of things that you may be able to tune better with the printer. This was a very particular challenging piece because it was just so long. So, yeah, I mean, overall, I think it came out okay. I'm going to remove the the brim and then i think this was a support for the uh for the latch so we should be able to just break that off okay let's go try it so unfortunately this doesn't look very good um it's not so much the color mismatch which yes it's definitely mismatched but it doesn't fit very well well first of all i noticed that the hinge is actually missing from here but we can fix that by 3D printing a new one and putting it in place. So that's okay. But even if the hinge is there, it this is just, I don't know, it just feels like the model wasn't measured properly. It It's too small for here. So if I put this one up against here, this one has a gap. And then if I close it like that, then there's like this part is sticking out and the angles aren't quite right. So... Yeah, I think this model really needs some more fine tuning. It's a nice start, but I don't think it's properly measured, or at least for this particular monitor. It's really too bad that printing this door didn't go more smoothly, but that actually gives you an idea of how things turn out. After wrestling with the printing process a bit, sometimes the result is a bit disappointing. In this particular case, it looks like the model just wasn't a very good fit for this monitor. We could try adjusting the model, but only the STL file is available for it. 
and it's possible to do, but it's not the easiest thing to modify. So I think for now, I'm just going to put it aside and maybe I'll come back to it some other day. Next, let's bring something much smaller, but probably also quite difficult to get right. A replacement keycap for this Commodore 64 that is missing this key over here. Here, the challenges are going to be getting the curves just right and fitting exactly in the plancher itself. So things will have to be very precise to work correctly. Assuming the print goes okay, one thing I'm very curious about is going to be the feel of the key. I don't expect it's going to be a perfect replacement at all, but it's going to be quite interesting to see how it comes out. As you would expect, someone has already modeled and shared the Commodore 64 keycaps online. Although you need to be pretty careful and get the keycaps for the right model Commodore 64 and even the right row, since each row is angled slightly differently. In the slicer, I'm going to choose the highest possible quality. I'll also select 100% infill to make the key as solid as possible. And because it doesn't have a flat surface of its own, I'm going to print it with a raft, which is a similar idea to the brim, but it actually prints a whole base for the model, not just around it. And of course, it's going to need some supports as well. As for the color, I don't have a PLA that remotely matches that dark brown color, so I'm going to go with the neutral gray. That should help us evaluate the final result visually and spot any imperfections more easily than a darker color. And after about an hour, here it is. And this is what it looks like. And yeah, the shape is pretty much spot on. The This is the raft, so let's remove it from here. It's a little bit more difficult to remove than a brim. Okay, right, because it was a raft plus the supports. So yeah, I mean, the shape is spot on. Here, I pulled out another one from the same row from the computer and the shape looks great. The bottom, yeah, that looks a little rough, but um, we'll see if it fits or not, but it looks pretty good. It's just that it doesn't have the smooth finish of a regular key. I mean, it's, it's not bad, but you can definitely feel there's a roughness to it, and you can even see it when the light shines in a particular way, you see the different lines. And again, if my printer was probably better tuned, that would have been less noticeable, but you're always gonna get some of that, especially in the top. I noticed that filament printers, they make top flat surfaces, they tend to be the roughest of all of them. So that's not great, but you know, as an emergency replacement is not bad. And yeah, I'm curious to see if this is gonna fit. Huh, it actually fit perfectly. So. Yeah, the dimensions of this model were perfect. Clearly the color is totally off and that's fine. I'm gonna put the one next to it. So you know what, if I'm typing, I can't even tell this is a replacement key, just, just by typing. If I rub my finger against it, I can tell it. But, and obviously the look is the worst part about it. But I think we can do better. Filament printing isn't the only game in town when it comes to 3D printing. Another major technology is called resin printing. This is the Mars 2 3D resin printer sent to me by Elegoo free of charge. Again, no strings attached. The reason I'm trying this now is because resin printing works very differently than filament printing, and it has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. But one of the advantages is that it can print things with much more detail than a filament printer. So this might be the perfect solution to print a perfect replacement key. In order to prepare this piece, I'm going to use a different slicer. This one came with a printer, but it is specially designed for resin printers. This is especially important when it comes to generating supports, which are completely different than the filament ones. Also, to make it easier to remove the piece from the plate, I'm going to print it at an angle. Yes, I know this is almost exactly the opposite of what you want with filament printers. So this just goes to show that you need to learn the quirks of each printer and each technology that you're using. The model is ready, but before we're gonna start printing, we need to talk about a big drawback of resin printer, health safety issues. When I first researched resin printing, I read that this stuff is somewhat toxic and it should be in a well-ventilated area. So I thought, okay, great, I'll put it right next to the window. And that's a pretty bad idea for multiple reasons. The first reason is that there's a lot of light that comes through the window, and that means UV light. Resin will cure with UV light, so it's definitely going to affect the print or the resin in the tank, so this is definitely not the right location. 
The second reason is that this stuff is pretty toxic. So just cracking open the window and hoping that it drifts away somehow, that is just not good enough. I would not be comfortable sitting in this room with the print going on in here for multiple days. We really need to find a way to take out all the fumes out of the room. And it's not just the air. There's a whole set of precautions you should be following to be completely safe. Basically, you should never ever breathe or touch this, ever. So in the end, I located a 3D printer in the bathroom area that I have here in the studio. Whenever I'm printing something, I am constantly running the bathroom fan. So that takes care of ventilating much better than having a window next to it, and there are zero UV rays around here. As for the rest of the precautions, anytime I do resin 3D print, I wear disposable gloves and a mask. The whole thing is complicated because you don't want to touch something with resin and then touch something else and contaminate it. So I have this whole set of procedures for things that can touch resin and things that can't. And as you're going to see in a moment, this stuff is not trivial because there's a lot of handling going on. Okay, let's do the actual print. I'll pour some resin in the container, put the base back on, and we are ready to start the print. The way resin printing works is kind of fascinating. The resin is a liquid material that will harden when exposed to UV light. The printer has an LCD panel at the bottom, and it will move the base to be right above it and flash one layer of the model. So the resin in the shape of that layer just became hard. That's actually the shape that is shown in the display as it's being printed, which is really cool. Then it will push the plate out a bit, back down next to the LCD, and flash the next layer. Repeat that for all the layers, and you have yourself a resin printed 3D model. Now that the print is done, it's time for cleaning, and this is pretty laborious. I want to put as much resin as possible back in the container, because it's expensive and toxic. Then I need to peel the part from the plate. This sometimes is not easy to do, and you need to do some scraping. All of that without flinging resin all over the place, of course. Now that I have the print, I can remove the supports by hand very easily. I need to be very careful with it, though, so it needs to go in the trash, specifically for contaminated waste that I don't want to touch. And next, I can clean it with some alcohol and a toothbrush. And finally, to make it completely safe, I'm going to put it in a curing station with a UV light to make it completely cured, hard, and totally safe to touch. I told you this was an involved process. And this is what we got after I remove it from the curing machine. And this is amazing. I mean, this is very, very smooth. This is just as smooth as the original keycap. It has a slightly different feel, but it's very smooth. Nothing in comparison with this. I mean, that feels so rough and unpolished compared to this that, yeah, this is, this is a whole new world. That feels great. Yeah, there's definitely none of the roughness and it feels just like any other key. So if we manage to get resin that is exactly this color and then maybe put a little sticker, yeah, you could make it look almost, almost like an original keycap. Now, was it worth it? The answer is a resounding yes. This piece looks great compared to the filament printed one. I would much rather print with things with filament because of how much easier the procedure is, but really when it comes to details and high resolution, this is the way to do it. So having both printers makes a lot of sense if you're going to be needing those kind of details in your projects. Before we print anything else, I wanted to talk briefly about materials. So far on the filament printer, I've been using PLA, which is the most common material, but there are lots of other different ones with different properties. PETG, for example, is a more resistant than PLA, so it's good for applications that require more strength. TPU is a somewhat flexible material, so it may be good for printing connectors. There are lots of other kinds, and each of them comes with a different set of requirements. Some of them will need specific melting temperatures or bed temperatures, and obviously prices will vary between some of them. And some of them, unfortunately, might even release toxic fumes and may need venting similar to resin material. And same thing applies to resins. You can find different kinds of resins with different properties, and so some of them will fit your own requirements. There's just so much to explore. Remember that I mentioned that this was a hobby in itself? All right, for the grand finale, I wanted to make a whole computer case. The immediate problem is the size. One of the main limiting factors of 3D printers is the volume they can print. This Ender 3 can do a cube of about 220 millimeters on the side, and the Mars 2 Pro, it's even smaller than that. So most cases won't print straight in there. You can buy more expensive printers with larger printing areas, but one thing you can often do 
is to split the model in some place and then print it as two or three or however many pieces you end up needing and then glue them together at the end. Especially if you make the parts have a good joint, which is that they have some overlapping tabs or maybe interlocking pieces, the result can be quite good. One example is the case of the Omega computer, which is a project to create an MSX2 computer from scratch. Apart from all the electronics, they also have models for the case, including a pre-split one for normal printer sizes. One day I'll make a whole video about that. For today, I'm going to go as small as I can since this is just a test, and we're going to print a case for a ZX80 replica computer. A friend of mine, Alvaro Alea, created this model, and there's a link to it in the description, and it's small enough that it might just fit on the bed of the Ender. But just in case, he also has a version of the case that is pre-split. I'm actually going to cheat a little bit here and just show you the final results for this one. This one is the one that my friend printed, and it looks amazing. It wasn't trivial to print though. If you look at it, there aren't many flat surfaces, so you have to print it with some temporary support. Also, the larger the piece, the higher the chances of something going wrong before the end, so I believe it took him several tries to get it right. Now let's try it in a completely different way. Sometimes you want to make a print and you don't have a 3D printer big enough for it, or maybe you don't have the experience to pull off a complicated print. There are services online that you can send them your model and they print it and ship it back to you. So I decided to try the 3D printing service offered by PCBWay. I've used them many times before for printing PCBs, so it made sense to give them a try. Also, as usual, even though they reimbursed me for this purchase, the deal is that I can still call it the way I see it with no strings attached. So this is going to be my experience with their 3D printing service unfiltered. So I decided to use the ZX80 case model since it was reasonably large and complicated, and I thought that would make a great stress test. So I updated the STL to their website, just like you would do with a PCB, and set up some of the parameters like materials, colors, etc. It took another week to get here, and I'm sure it could have picked a faster delivery, but I didn't want to spend even more money. And then, this is what I got. My first thought when I handled this case is that there was a mistake. They clearly must have done this in some kind of injection molding, but that makes no sense, since the big drawback of injection molding is that you have to make a mold first, and that it's just really expensive and time-consuming. But it feels that way. If you look really closely, there you can kind of guess about some lines, but this is nothing like any filament printing that I've done. I'm actually wondering if this is actually a resin printing. I talked about the engineer about this when they gave me some feedback, and I thought we had agreed on PLA, and the order still says PLA, but maybe this is resin. It would kind of make sense. It is super smooth in a way that none of my prints are. It is a little thin though, so that's definitely thinner than the filament printed case that my friend printed. So I don't know what kind of magic this is, but this is absolutely amazing. But this has one pretty big drawback. This wasn't cheap. Initially, when I uploaded the models in their system, it quoted me 20 per half of the case, not even including shipping. And later, after they looked at the model and gave us some feedback, they must have determined that it needed some extra work for support or whatever, and the top case went up to $37. So the end result ended up being $57 plus $22 for shipping. I'm not going to lie, that is expensive. But the final product is way beyond my expectations. So I really wouldn't use this for a service of something that I can easily print myself, and I also wouldn't use it for something that I'm trying to make lots of units maybe to sell, but for difficult, large, in one-off prints, this is pretty great. I will definitely look into using something like this when I print a case for a whole computer, for example. So far, I've been assuming that models for whatever you want to print are available out there, and they often are, as we have seen, but there will come the time when some of them will not be available. In that case, you'll just have to make your own. The good news is that it's not a hugely difficult process. There are lots of tools out there for 3D modeling, and lots of them are free as well. I personally learned the basics of Fusion 360 because so many people in the 3D printing community were using it, and it seems to have a good support for that. There are lots of YouTube tutorials out there, and that's how I learned, and you can go from knowing nothing to making a case from scratch, something boxy and square, in about 10 minutes, so that is great. And once you've mastered that, the rest is just learning specific features to make more and more complex shapes. I know it's not much, but for example, these are some of the models I created a few months ago for organizing some board games I have. It's just really fun going through the process of measuring the physical elements, figuring out how you're going to use them, printing it, and then seeing the final result. One thing I absolutely love about Fusion 360 is the concept of parameters. 
When you make a sketch, instead of typing how many units you want something to be, you can instead enter a parameter name. So I can make a box that is, for example, box width by box height dimension. The awesome thing about it is that later, and maybe even after you print it and decide that that model is too small, I can come back, change the parameter, and the model is automatically updated to reflect that. On the other hand, I'm not sure if I can go as far as to actually recommend Fusion 360. First of all, it has some really weird licensing terms. But the worst part is that it's a total dog of a program. I have a top-of-the-line MacBook Pro maxed out on RAM and CPU, and yet Fusion 360 reminds me of the times when I would start up 3ds Max on a Pentium Pro, and it would take like 30 or 40 seconds for the program just to start. I don't know what it's doing, but the user experience is absolutely abysmal. If someone knows of a free alternative to Fusion 360 that also has the feature for having parameters for sketches, let me know and I'll probably make the switch. There are so many interesting things that we could print for retro computers that I could just keep going for a long time, including printing cute mini retro computer replicas. I'm convinced that 3D printing is an excellent companion hobby to retro computers. And as we just saw, there are lots and lots of applications. But one of the great things about 3D printing is that it also has a lot of other applications to other hobbies. I've done organizers and miniatures like we saw for board games. I've done tools and jigs for woodworking, organizers just for the house in general, and even some tools for the electronics lab itself. Chances are you'll find uses to just about any area. But also keep in mind that this is still its own hobby. So apart from the money and space invested, expect to spend some extra time researching and tweaking things. Once you get filament printing down, it's just really easy to make more of them. Resin makes for outstanding results, but the process is quite stressful, at least for me, so I just haven't used it as much. If you're thinking of getting into this, definitely start with a filament printer and only consider resin later if you think you need that. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.